The main attraction of Corfu, the neoclassical Achilleon Castle, was built in 1863, based on the design of an Italian architect, ordered by Austrian Queen Elizabeth. The Queen had followed the Schliemann excavations attentively, roved through the sites of the Trojan War, and collected ancient artifacts. Her palace was named after her biggest hero, Achilles. After the death of her son, Rudolf, she spent more and more time in the Achilleon. When Sissy was assassinated in 1898, the palace was purchased by Kaiser William I, who also loved ancient Greece. Over the years, the castle has served as a military hospital, a boarding school, then a casino. Today, it's a tourist attraction in which the ancient collections of the Queen and the Emperor are on display. A castle stood on the place of the old fortress even in the 5th century. It was strengthened by Byzantium, who built the capital as protection against the attacks of Goths, Vandals, and Slavic peoples. Later, the buildings were linked by an underground labyrinth and surrounded by a moat. The bridge spanning it leads to the Esplanade. The exhibition set up in the fortress reflects the Venetian rule that lasted more than 400 years. The neoclassical building, which stands on the northern side of the main square, was the office of the English governors. After the secession of the Brits, it became the residence of the Greek royal family. Today, an extremely rich Asian art collection can be found in it. The jewel of the main square is the elegant and aristocratic Arcade of Liston. It was designed by the engineer de Lesseps, the father of the builder of the Suez Canal, and patterned at the Rue de Rivoli. Earlier, only noblemen used to be allowed to walk here. In the meantime, the pleasant shelter offered by the cafes and restaurants of the arcade is gladly accepted by tourists. The houses with wrought iron balconies and blue-green screened windows in the old town were built under French rule. Thus, it's of course not by accident that this part of the capital inspires a feeling of the French Riviera, or Italian coastal cities. The bell towers cast their shadows on old wells, narrow alleys, and winding steep stairs. The little scenic streets lead to some squares with quite odd-shaped ground plans. The most beautiful building of the Campiello district is the Panagia Antivoniotisa church. Here, Icons and paintings have been exhibited by such famous masters as Lombardos and Damaschinos since the 11th century. Not far from the airport, next to Kathiapulu Lagoon, stands the most visited and most photographed site of Corfu, the Vlacherna Monastery. The church, with its white bell tower, which is considered to be a symbol of the island, was built on a small peninsula and can be reached on a narrow footbridge from the land opposite. Behind it, the romantic verdant Ponte Canisi Island, or Mouse Island, can be found with its white stairs curving among the evergreens to lead us to a little nunnery. The fishing village called Calami, and probably all of Corfu, was brought into notoriety by the English naturalist Gerald Durrell in his many popular and lively novels. He writes about his childhood spent on Corfu in My Family and Other Animals, Birds, Beasts, and Relatives, and The Garden of the Gods, among his other books. Cassiope is one of the most beautiful villages of the island. Formerly, it was visited by Cicero, Nero, Marcus Antonius, and Casanova. As a memento of the past, only the fortress walls remained here, which were built by the Anjou much later. Now the intactness of the tranquil village is no longer threatened by Ottoman troops, but by the rush of tourists. Sidari is the most popular and fashionable holiday resort of the area. The characteristically striped walls of sandstone bearing memories of several millennia and rock formations shaped by water and wind appear on almost every postcard of Corfu. A famous side of the city is the Canal d'Amour, or Love Channel, which assures naive couples that if they swim across it, they will stay together forever. Sidari is not only a perfect beach, but also the departure point of cruises. Ships leave to Diapontia Island, Paleocastrica, and Cassiope from here. Of course, we can rent other watercrafts too, for instance paddle boats or kayaks.
Sideri is a favorite place for couples of different age groups and nationalities, and the sandbanks and shoals, which can easily be reached walking in water, make it an ideal place for every swimmer. One of the peaks of the mountains rising above Paleocastrica was named, not by accident, Bella Vista, or Beautiful View. The view opening up from the terrace of the cafe is one of the most fantastic panoramas, even on a world scale. The two bays are separated by a narrow promontory. Their cliffs are covered with rich vegetation. It's worth getting a closer view of the reefs and cliffs shooting out of the sea by boat or paddle boat. Several smaller rock cavities were formed here. Many caves can be found in the cliffs. The light reflecting from the bottom of these caves and passing through the water creates unlikely shades of blue and green. Local boatmen will gladly show these places, which remind us of the famous Blue Cave of Capri. Paleocastrica is the place where, according to Homer, Odysseus and Nausicaa met. The Panagia Monastery has been standing on one of the peninsulas dividing the coastline since 1228. Its current shape was created in the 18th century. Several dozen monks used to live here. Today, it's a museum exhibiting authentic articles of personal use as well as a valuable icon collection. From the terrace of the monastery, the view of the 18th century citadel, Angelocastra, is beautiful. Crete is 260 kilometers long and is called the Great Island by the Greeks. Its capital city, Heraklion, was the harbor of Knossos in ancient times. Later, the most influential slave market of the Mediterranean Sea was operating here, ruled by Arabs, Byzantines, and then Venetians. The relics of the arched dry docks of the Venetians are still standing today. The ships of the famous Venetian fleet were built and repaired in the arsenal. Today, tourists enjoy the cool of their shade. Knossos, the center of the Minoan culture, is only five kilometers away from the capital city. The palace block was excavated by Arthur Evans, British archaeologist and linguist, in the 19th century. Significant events of Greek mythology, such as the defeat of the Minotaur, the guarding of the labyrinth by the help of Ariadna's thread, or the flight of Daedalos and Icarus took place here. The legends continue to occupy the minds of people so much that millions of tourists visit Knossos year after year. The beach of Matala is framed by a steep sandstone wall. In the cavities of the wall live some monks even in times before Christ. In the 1960s and 70s, hippies and easy riders found the freedom of their rebellious mind there and moved into the caves that have since become a tourist site. Ios Nikolaos was built on the little peninsula of the coast of the scenic Mirabello Bay, a specially situated Mediterranean town. Its salty inner lake is bordered by steep cliffs and a little bridge crosses over its narrow sea outlet. Some boats anchor in the lake, some sailing ships in the bay, and some fishing boats too, which supply restaurants on the promenade with fresh fish and other seafood. The little sloping streets converge at the harbor and the bay. Shops and places of entertainment are packed in along the streets. Some very special, interesting excursions can be made from Ios Nikolaos to the ruins of the sunken pirate town Olus or to Spinalonga, the dead city. Retimno is the third most densely populated city of the island and the center of Cretan cultural life at the same time. It's also an academic city taking pride in its music academy and academy of fine arts. In its architecture, of course, Venetian as well as Turkish influence can be shown. Due to this, the look of the old town is extremely lively. The intimate square is framed by Turkish-style buildings with wooden porches and Venetian residential houses where the Rimondi Fountain can be found. Its ornamented Corinthian pillars surround a gargoyle with three lion heads.
Cretan specialty is the carefully prepared wreath-shaped bread. The Venetian fortress Fortezza was built on the ruins of the ancient citadel of Retina, on a strategic point of the harbor. The bay is the dream of all photographers and filmmakers. Wherever they look, they can find an outstanding object. Cania, the second most populous city of Crete, still preserves its scenic medieval image. A motor raft carries guests to the restaurant built on the pier. The curving, narrow alleys of the old town, together with medieval Venetian Ottoman houses and 19th century neoclassical buildings, combine to create an amazing picture. On top of this, Lefka Ori Mountain lies like a jewel in the background. A characteristic feature of Kanya is the handsome cab in which tourists are driven around the old town. A large part of the three-kilometer-long town wall exists even today. Departing from the fortress called Castelli, we can walk along the edge of the bay, along the long lines of shops situated on the ground floor of Venetian patrician houses. The now classical film Zorba the Greek was recorded near Kania, which was written by the greatest son of Crete, Nikos Kazantakis, with music composed by Theodorakis. Circus Bastion stands opposite the Marine Museum, which is noteworthy due to the fact that the Greek flag with its blue and white stripes and cross was hoisted here. The crown of the natural beauties of Crete is Samaria Gorge, which is part of the world heritage. The majestic peaks sometimes hide bashfully behind the clouds. A long, crooked road leads to the entry of the National Park. From Zeloscalo, Narrow stairs lead down the side of the gorge, which offers an unforgettable sight, with protected plants, a species of mouflin only to be found here, as well as spectacular rock formations. At the entrance, visitors are given a card, which has to be returned at the exit so that mountain rescuers know if someone is missing and can go in search of them. The abyss reaches the sea after 18 kilometers at Ayurumali. Tired hikers can have a rest, eat and drink, or swim in the sea here before going back to Horda Skafion by boat. Rhodes is the biggest island of the Dodecanese. The prosperity of the island was mentioned by Homer several times since it acquired colonies in Asia Minor and in the territory of modern-day France, even in times before Christ. The city was built on the grounds of three ancient palaces in 408 BC, and it was put on the map by being named one of the seven wonders of the world, the Colossus of Rhodes. The modern city mixes the ancient network of streets and medieval Gothic buildings with Oriental-style minarets and mosques. The center of the town is the Hippocrates Square, decorated with a fountain. There's a nice view of the lively square from the terraces of the surrounding taverns and restaurants. The busy streets with several little shops are like a Turkish bazaar, which is no coincidence since we are in the Turkish district. The Osmanli, as in the case of every conquered area, left their mark on this place in the form of Turkish spas, jamis, mosques, and minarets. In the harbor stands St. Stephen's Cathedral, which is well known for its church clock. Next to it, we can find the ornamented building of the prefecture, the monument of Italian occupation. Nia Agora, the Moorish-style marketplace, and the beach fit well into this environment. The Johannite military order worked on roads from 1306 to 1522. The Street of the Knights, which is one of the most intimate parts of the city, starts from the Palace of the Grand Master. The surprisingly sound ancient monument itself would warrant a visit to the island of Rhodes. The order of the militant monks, who wore red vests decorated with the crucifix above their chain armor, became extremely wealthy by obtaining, with papal assistance, the fortune of their rival, the dissolved Order of the Temple. 
Their fleet of black galleys played a significant role in commercial shipping. Meanwhile, they were continuously working on fortifying their towns. The 15-meter-thick castle walls rebutted even two Ottoman attacks, but they could not defy the 100,000-strong army of Suleiman I and the Sultan conquered Rhodes. Afterwards, the knights were expelled to the island of Crete, then Malta, and their order has been known as the Order of Malta ever since. On the pier of the harbor stand three characteristic windmills that used to grind grain transported by ships as early as the 1400s. The second most visited place of the island is Lindos. The harbor can be seen clearly from the mountain where Apostle Paul was believed to have found shelter from the stormy sea. The white houses frame the mountain like a collar on which the gray citadel stands. First, a temple devoted to Athena was erected on the 120-meter-high cliff. Then a castle was built on this place in Byzantine times, which was later altered to a real fortress by Johannite knights. The Acropolis of eight and a half square meters can be reached only after a long walk up the stairs. Riding a donkey for this journey is not so tiring and much more exciting. By the way, the donkey is a characteristic means of transport in Greece, so it's worth getting familiar with it. Because of increased tourist trade, the village has been beautifully renovated. Almost every house has opened a shop, tavern, bar, or ice cream bar where we can find the indispensable souvenirs or taste the specialties of Greek cuisine. Multi-storied hotel blocks are unknown here. Instead, rather familiar six- or eight-room pensions can be found. The island of Kos is called the island of peace, soul, and tranquility, yet it's still most widely known as the birthplace of Hippocrates. Everything reminds us of the father of medicine here. An extremely old sycamore tree stands behind the Johannite fortress where the students of Hippocrates used to sit in the shade and study the mysteries of medicine. The island is only eight kilometers away from the Turkish coast, near the town of Bodrum, which was called Halicarnassus in ancient times. It seems as if the history book of Kos had been carbon copied from that of Rhodes. Its masters were first the Dorians, then the Achaeans. Later, it was conquered by Byzantium and Venice. In the 14th century, the Johannites did some fortifying work here. In 1522, it was conquered by the Ottomans, their mosques and minarets creating an oriental atmosphere in the city. The wide excavation area revealing the remains of the ancient marketplace is only a few steps away from the city center. The eight Corinthian pillars of a portico, the remains of the shrine of Aphrodite from the 4th century BC can still be seen here, in addition to a three-nave Paleo-Christian basilica. The massive arches covered the town spa where citizens could swim in the warm water of the springs. The floors of spas, houses, and churches were decorated with mosaics. The modern marketplace and market hall of the city can be found not far from Agora. Here, besides fresh vegetables and fruit, we can buy dried herbs, jams, flavored olive oil, and some oriental sweets.
Asclepion is a 2,400-year-old health resort which is established after the death of Hippocrates, but in his spirit. One of the most important points of his doctrines was that he separated the sciences from the holy office. The place was named after the mythological figure, the son of Apollo. On the first floor of the four-story building were the spas and guest rooms. Healing took place in the porticos of the second and third floor, while the church was located on the top floor. Spa therapy, herbal cure, massage, even hypnosis, meditation, and special diets were used to treat people. Zia, a tradition-abiding small village, was built on the highest point of the island at 840 meters, from where the setting sun above the Aegean Sea offers a spectacular view. Travel agencies bring their visitors here to a dinner and folklore evening with music and dance. After the amazing sunset, tasting excellent Greek wines livens the atmosphere. The small island of Patmos is the northwest neighbor of Kos. Skala, the capital of the island, is a center of cultural life. The St. John Monastery and Fortress, surrounded by the White Houses of Hora, which is a major tourist attraction, towers above the city. Its skyline is similar to that of Lindos. From the road leading to the fortress, we can go off the track to reach the Cave of the Apocalypse, where, according to legend, the voice of God called St. John the Evangelist. A curving road leads up to the tranquil, intimate Hora, where apart from some cafes and shops selling trinkets, nothing can be found but serenity, sun-kissed stones, blooming oleanders, and a fascinating panorama. The silence and the view compensate us for the difficulties of the journey. The neighbors of Patmos, Leros, and Lipsy can be seen clearly from here, which despite their dramatic past are peaceful little islands inhabited by fishermen. Patmos, which was once under papal protectorate, has always been an ecclesiastical center. In its churches, numerous orthodox icons can be admired and even bought at some places. Devotional objects have always had a special cult in the religious Greece. The golden brown walls of the monastery are encircled by a scalloped molding. The building is a fanciful mixture of terraces, stairs, closed yards, and archways that has gained its present form over many centuries. Santorini, lying a hundred kilometers north of Crete, is the most beautiful island providing us the essence of Hellas. 
the white houses of its capital, Fira, crowd all in a heap in a lively extravaganza. Every curve of the narrow, winding alleys larded with stairs shows yet another miracle. The flat roof of the houses is the terrace of the flat above, from where the view of the incredibly blue surface of the Aegean Sea is simply amazing. The 587-stair journey from Fira to the harbor of Scala, where pleasure boats depart to the little nearby islands, can be taken on donkey back or cable railway. The long row of cube-shaped houses is broken by a blue dome church or a thatched windmill. The windows of blue shuttered houses appear even livelier with their geraniums. Tourists relax in swimming pools, the sun flashes, the salty fragrance of the sea can be smelled while white boats float towards unknown destinations. The once rounded island shrank to a crescent shape due to a volcanic eruption in Minoan times. An active volcano, frequently spitting ashes and lava, used to stand on the place where now the sea shines in the Bay of the Crescent. In the 15th century BC, the volcano erupted. The mountain disappeared at that time, creating the present form of Santorini. The sea was ablaze for four days between Terra and Terracia, wrote an ancient author, when a two-kilometer-long flaming lava island, Paleocamene, or the Old Stone, emerged from the ebullient sea. More recent eruptions frightened the islanders even in the 1950s. The beach of Kamari, covered with black volcanic sand, can be found near the airport. The settlement was built at the foot of the oldest mountain of the Aegean Sea, Mesa Vuno, which was a harbor of Thera in ancient times. It was also sunk by a volcanic eruption until it was brought to surface again by another one in the last century. The village had to be rebuilt from its ruins after the earthquake in 1956. By today, Kamari has become the most prosperous and fast-developing resort of the island. It's popular and loved for its clean water and sandy beaches, as well as for a wide choice of water sports and activities. The intimate promenade is attractively framed by hotels of varying categories. Akrotiri is considered to be one of the most significant excavations in the world nowadays. A French geologist took notice of the pieces of rocks which turned up from under the tuff, and this finally led to the excavation of the surprisingly sound 3,000-year-old town. It happened more than 50 years before Evans discovered the ruins of Knossos Palace on Crete, so nobody had the faintest idea about Minoan culture. The findings, appearing sometimes from under 15-meter-deep volcanic ashes, confirmed the assumptions of Marintos, a famous archaeologist, concerning the expanded Minoan Empire working with Crete as its center. The appearance of Ea is thought to outshine even that of the capital city, Fira. The mixture of intimate houses is the embodiment of a Greek dream itself. There's simply no travel agency without a brochure full of pictures luring tourists to Hellas. The unique architecture of Santorini is defined by its geographical position. Here, people manage to make a virtue of necessity. Poverty-stricken families made use of the quite good workability of pyrogenous pumice and dugout cavern houses in the steep side of the caldera. The volcanic rock from the mountain was used as building material. The cradle vault, due to lack of wood, was made of stone. Wealthier people later added porches to the caverns. The terraces are separated by small, plastered stone fences and little wooden gates. The streets are replaced or supplemented by winding stairs. The usage of white, blue, and recently pastel shades are just as characteristic as the decorations. The style itself is called Aegean, or Cyclades.
Nowadays, amateurs argue a lot about whether Atlantis, the marvelous land first described by Plato, existed or not. Galanopoulos, the Greek geologist, immediately assumed that Minoan Crete and Santorini together formed Atlantis. The fictional continent was said to be in the Atlantic Ocean, however. Yet the Minoan Empire certainly shows similarities to the ideal state imagined by Plato. Moreover, the catastrophe said to have destroyed Atlantis shows great similarity to the eruption and explosion of the Santorini volcano, earthquakes, and tsunami that destroyed the Minoans. The stakes are enormously high. If Atlantis had existed, the Man of the Stone Age would not be a descendant of the Neanderthal ancestors, but the survivor of a civilization that had existed earlier, but was destroyed in a worldwide cataclysm. The evidence would basically knock holes in the theories established about the evolution of mankind. Camping isn't fashionable on the Greek islands. Penniless youngsters, however, look for this type of holiday. Thus, Eos, only 50 kilometers away from Santorini, has become the popular center of backpackers. The center of the island is the harbor and the capital city, only a 15-minute walk away from it. Here, we can also find Venetian castle ruins, narrow arched streets, whitewashed houses, several windmills, and even more chapels. The terraces of taverns and restaurants are simply one after another in the evenings, turning the whole town into one big entertainment area. Early spring and late autumn brings an idyllic calm to the island, which shows its more beautiful side at this time. On the popular beaches of the island, we can try jet skiing, surfing, water skiing, parachuting, and other water sports, but the water, which is clear and transparent even in the deep, favors divers too. The historic cultural site of Eos is far away from the harbor and crowded beaches. Today it's impossible to decide whether it was a legend that Homer, on his way to Athens, lodged on Eos. The blind poet is thought to have been struck by death and was buried here. The monument erected on the place of the tomb stands near Plakatos, on a cliff facing the sea, in the northeast corner of the island, since the tomb itself sank into the sea due to a landslide. In the harbor, the statue of Homer bids farewell to visitors. For a long time, Mykonos was mentioned only as a transit station among tourists who arrived to visit the excavation site of Delos. Then it became an outstanding holiday resort in the 50s and 60s. What's the secret of its success? Undoubtedly, everything can be found here just like on other islands. Cycladic houses with white walls lined cobblestone narrow alleys winding on the basis of a quite incomprehensible logic. 
The shutter blinds and protruding wooden balconies protecting from the ferocious sun are painted colorfully. The stairs of whitewashed houses are packed full of pots of climbing geraniums. The colorful gorgeous blossoms of hibiscus, oleanders, and climbing rose creep high up the walls. Ships anchoring in the harbor, blue dome churches, and round windmills make the landscape more lively and colorful. However, this would make the island hardly more than a tourist center. The fortune, or misfortune, of Mykonos is that its circle of guests is completely different from those of the other islands. Mykonos has always accepted differences, and that's why it's become so heterogeneous itself. It's made the island the favorite European holiday resort of Hollywood celebrities, rock stars, nudists, homosexuals, bohemian artists, capital aristocracy, and playboys. Intimate little shops are hidden in houses where we can choose among characteristic Greek souvenirs. The tables in the taverns, installed in the shade of vine arbors and reed blinds, are covered with blue and white check tablecloths. And, of course, there's plenty to put on them. Spit roasted meat, pita bread, fresh salad, local wines, and iced coffee. In the morning, when the kings of nightlife are still asleep, the island is not so different from the others. The capital city, Hora, spreads in a bay framed by small hills. In the Fisher's Harbor, we can see characteristic boatmen in captain's caps decorated with an anchor and in striped t-shirts, as if they had just stepped out of the pages of an extreme adventure novel. The reason why they seem so interesting is that they're real, as well as the rugged fishermen or the women bargaining in the market or the old men arguing on the terrace of a tavern. The picture of the street wouldn't be complete without them. The background to this scene is the distant buzuki music, the horn of ships, the noise of exhaust pipe, and the Tower of Babel talk in town. The scenic Alafkandra quarter was built by wealthy captains and merchants. During the day, tourists wander along its houses. In the harbor, such large ships line up that the little white houses climbing up the mountain are simply dwarfed by them. We can quickly and comfortably travel from island to island by ferry, liner, and hydrofoil However, before organizing a tour to other islands, it's worth checking the timetable carefully. The island is not really big. Those, however, who believe that there's nowhere to go apart from the capital city are mistaken. Over the past decades, holiday resorts have been built in every possible place. For instance, Megaliamnos, Platis Gialos, Ornos near Hora, or the popular Ios Ioannis, with more and more luxurious hotels and several kinds of entertainment and sports facilities. Farther on the south coast of the island, we can choose Calo de Vadi, Aya Ana, or Calafatis. Islands who were frightened of the jealous Hera refused to accept the pregnant Leto. The infertile Baron Delos had nothing to lose, so the grandchild of the giants gave birth to the divine son of Zeus, Apollo. Leto brought prosperity to the island in gratitude. So much for mythology. In fact, Delos became a significant religious center in the 7th century BC. At that time, it was under the protection of Naxos. The continuously expanding Athens formed the Delian League after defeating the Persians. 
the treasures coming from taxes were carried to the Parthenon. At the same time, a complete cleaning of the island was ordered, even the graves were opened and remains of the dead were removed. Birth and death were banned. Pregnant women and dying Delians were transported to another island. The long-forgotten event, the Delian Games, were revived when people used to sing and dance, organized performances, sport activities, and feasts in honor of Apollo. The area of ruins spreading all over the island, together with the little museum of Delos, attracts people from all over the world who are fond of Greek culture and archaeology. A part of the antique Delos with a good atmosphere could have been the Saint Lake, which unfortunately has in the meantime dried out. The fragmented, archaic lion statues have become a symbol of the island. Five lions out of the nine erected by Naxians have remained in Delos. One is in Venice and three are missing. On the Poseidon portico, the sanctuary of Leto and the stadium stood next to the lake. The 113-meter-high Mount Kintos, rather more of a hill, was also an important cult center, and later the theater quarter was created here. Today, the Greek theater and some partly reconstructed residential houses can be visited there. The single-storied residential homes were built around a marble-pillared, arched inner courtyard. The walls were decorated with frescoes, the floors with mosaics. The mosaics of the House of the Dolphins and the House of the Trident are particularly beautiful. Naxos, which used to be rich and of great significance in ancient times, cannot compete with Santorini and Mykonos today. The infrastructure of the biggest island of the Cyclades is now under construction. If we stand facing the scenic amphitheatrical town, the Palatia Peninsula with its famous marble gate can be seen on the left side, while Palatia, the lively arched main square, on the right. The continuance of the main square is the promenade following the coastline. The Venetian castle and the surrounding romantic old town rise above it. The monumental marble gate is the remains of an unfinished Apollo temple from 26 centuries ago. From the main square or the Coso Promenade, we can walk up to Castro on winding and ever ascending streets. This scenic part of town divided by stairs and arches is Burgos, inhabited chiefly by Orthodox believers. Everything that is important for tourism can be found in the trade district at the beach. Among the stores, gift shops, cafes and pubs, travel agencies, program offices, shipping companies, airlines, exchange offices and car rentals can be found, plus automatic teller machines. Among the seven towers of the citadel, only one has remained. Behind the castle wall stands the Palace of the Duke. One of its wings houses the descendants of the family. Their coat of arms can still be seen above the entry. The other wing functions as a cultural venue. The 13th century Catholic cathedral reminds us of the Venetian aristocracy whose generations were buried here. The guarantee for the future of the island are windless, long, sandy coasts where dozens of beaches have been developed suitable for sunbathing, swimming, and doing water sports.
Agriculture has played a significant role recently on the island, which has richer vegetation than the Cyclades in general. Donkeys are used only for carrying things. However, goats and sheep are more universal, making good lawnmowers and main courses in a traditional Greek lunch or dinner. In the beautiful country, a steep serpentine leads up to Zeus Mountain and Philoti that is famous for its marble mining. In the first week of August, a jollity is organized in honor of Dionysus on the Little Palatia Peninsula, which was the site of the wedding of the god of wine and Ariadne. At such times, tourists and locals alike celebrate with music, dancing, literary programs, procession with torches, bazaar, and fireworks. The island of Paros lies at the intersection of the routes of cruises in the Cyclades. Its gently sloping hills are just as green as those of Naxos, only eight kilometers away. The uncountable number of shellfish make the selection of a fishmonger richer and richer. Clams, snails, seahorses, corals, starfishes. Nausa is the most beautiful settlement of the idyllic island. The dual bay, the little Venetian fortress standing in the water, the whitewashed houses or those made of natural stone, arched gateways, rocking fishing boats between the two rows of houses, the terraces of taverns and colorful flowers turned the fishing village into an amazing sight. Every August, a hundred boats decorated with flaming torches commemorate a victorious sea battle from the 16th century. The islands of the Cyclades played a significant role in the history of civilization, even in prehistoric times. The praise of the world, however, dies down, and the economy of the islands has declined by the end of the 19th century. The entailing immigration wave led to a slow depopulation. Thousands of Greeks tried their fortune in the United States and several other countries. The meager work possibilities offered a very poor living standard for those who stayed at home. During the recovery between the two world wars in the happy, peaceful years, new citizens of Western Europe started to look for the new holiday destinations here. Besides the Alps, the Italian cities, and the French Riviera, they wanted to discover new holiday resorts. Hellas came into fashion again it became fashionable to reread the sagas of Greek mythology. The bourgeoisie and aristocracy discovered Rhodes, Santorini, and Delos for themselves. World War II, however, intervened. Booming tourism in the 60s and 70s drove a lot of immigrant Greeks back to their home, and this development revived the economy. The road network and communication system were improved, and holiday centers and beaches emerged out of nowhere. Colombitris, this one-of-a-kind beach, can be approached by car or powerboat from Nausa. The whims of nature cause such round and wrinkled stones to be formed like nowhere else in Greece. The varied rock formations embrace the silky, sandy bays. It's a wonderful place for those who wish to enjoy the pleasures of summer, sunshine and sea secluded from the world. Paros has always been famous for its marble quarries. It supplied the material for Venus de Milo, 
Moreover, the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, as well as his gravestone of Napoleon, was built from this. A temple, Panagia Hecatontapiliani, built partly of marble, stands in the capital city too. According to legend, the best student of the builder of Hagia Sophia in Istanbul created such a masterpiece in this temple that his envious master wanted to push him off the roof. But Ignatius dragged the teacher down and both of them died on the spot. We can also find here the ruins of a citadel, a Venetian fortress built by using the remains of an antique sanctuary, a Paleo-Christian basilica, an archaeological museum, a monastery, and a spa from the 4th century. However surprising it is, not these, but the intimate walking streets will leave a mark in the heart of tourists who visit the place. The mountainsides of Tinos are dominated by vineyards and the valleys by olive groves. It's a quiet, tranquil, but cheerful island, overrun by noisy, milling crowds only twice a year. The pilgrimage in honor of the miraculous icon is held in March and August every year. It happened in 1940 that during the celebration, a Greek cruiser which was anchoring in the harbor was torpedoed by an Italian submarine. The monument and the memorial chapel in the harbor pay respect to the victims of the attack. A lot of believers, in the hope of being healed, climb the hundreds of meters up to the temple built on top of the hill, crawling on their knees. There are numerous shops in the streets leading from the harbor to the temple. Gifts, oriental sweets, spicy olive oils, and honey are sold here. However, the souvenirs that are sold in enormous quantities in the shops of Tinos are sacred images, devotional objects, candles, and icons. Panagia Evangelistria, the famous pilgrim church, was built of white marble in neoclassical style in the 1830s. Delian marble remains were also used in the building. There's a wide staircase leading to the closed yard, which is framed by decorative arched buildings from three sides. The miraculous icon is said to be the work of St. Luke, and it was found in the 10th century crypt chapel by a nun, Sister Pelagia, who was later sainted by the church. Newborn babies are baptized with the trickling water of the spring that is thought to have healing power. The atmosphere of the temple is intimate. Its flower garden is guarded by the statues of the former archbishop. In the small arched wing joined to the building, apart from some museums, the sacristy and seminary were provided for. The art gallery and the exhibition of local artists are also very interesting. The treasury and the Byzantine Museum, however, are simply impossible to miss. we should definitely see the touching mausoleum of the Ellie Cruiser. The inside of the church, which is not very spacious, is fully packed with luxurious chandeliers, candlesticks, icons, incense sticks, and pictures. The most scenic settlement of the island is Pyrgos. This mountain town is the center of the production of marble that is mined nearby. Thousands of strange little buildings can be seen in Tinos. The Columbary, the two-story white building as big as a normal house decorated with geometrical patterns, 
was the invention of Venetians who were indulged in breeding carrier pigeons. Looking back from the ruins of the Venetian castle named after St. Helen, we can see not only Tinos, but the Aegean Sea and the enchanting Greek islands in it. <laughs>